So I'm Mike Falkowski. I'm a program scientist at NASA headquarters. I'm in the uh, terrestrial ecology program. And then also as part of my responsibilities at, at NASA, I am a program scientist for the Arctic and Boreal Vulnerability Experiment, otherwise known as BOVE. And that, of course, is um, we, we do a lot of work from within that program up in the Arctic and Boreal region of uh, the US and Canada. Torsten? Yeah, hi, I'm Torsten Marcus. I'm the uh, program manager for Cryosphere together with Colleen. And, you know, we'll talk about Cryosphere in a minute. I'm also the uh, program scientist for Operation Icebridge and the ISA 2 mission. And hi, I'm Colleen Hafke, and I'm Deputy Program Manager for Cryospheric Sciences, uh, working with Torsten. And you can probably take it back, Mike. Yeah. Sounds good. And so I'm going to spend the first couple of minutes just talking a little bit about uh, the structure of the NASA Earth Science Division, and then specifically how what we do relates to the Arctic. And so right here, I have a slide of, of the organization um, within the NASA Earth Science Division. And so we have these different, these four different areas. We have flight. Um, and what happens in flight is this is uh, the building of, of satellites and the deployment of satellites to space. And so it's really sort of the operational side of things, um, getting missions from, from being built and then launched and then operating them in space. Uh, we have the Earth Science Technology Office, and this is really focused on technology development, specifically I guess not specifically, but uh, a lot of what they do is, is focused on sensor development and getting sensors ready to either deploy on aircraft or, or ultimately on spacecraft for collecting Earth observation data. Uh, we have the Applied Sciences Program, which, which um, leverages NASA remote sensing data and or models uh, to really focus on, on helping uh, managers and practitioners solve very applied problems um, by, by using our data to, to support some of the science. And then where Colleen and Thorsten and I sit is within the research and analysis division. This is where a majority of our funding programs sit, um, at least in terms of uh, our ROSES calls. And that program, it's, it's run by Jack Kay. And so I'm going to um, drill down a little bit on that program here right now. And so NASA is a little bit different than other agencies with regard to how we approach our scientific programs. And so when, when we think about something like the Arctic, um, we don't have any one program that specifically focuses on the Arctic itself. itself. Uh, within NASA Earth Science, within the um, research and analysis program, we're very interested in learning how the Earth system works as a whole. And so we're, we're looking at how systems operate, um, like the climate and weather, uh, oceans, and, and then how they interact. And so what I have here is a, it, it's a um, figure or a graph showing um, all our different focus areas. So we have a focus area within climate variability and change, this is where the cryospheric sciences program sits. We have <coughs> interior, we have weather, we have carbon cycle and ecosystems. That's where the program I'm associated with sits, terrestrial ecology. We have atmospheric composition. Um, and just a second here, I'm having a hard time seeing. And then we have the, our water and energy cycle um, focus area. And so when we think about the Arctic, any one of these, uh, focus areas will have a program that has at least some research interests in the Arctic, some more so than others. So you can imagine, for example, cryosphere, which I said sits in climate variability and change, of course, is very active in the Arctic as well as the Antarctic and, and other uh, ice covered areas of, 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 the, uh, of the globe. And then, you know, just for the carbon and cycle ecosystems example, you know, we don't, the trust really pro ecology program sits in that focus area and we do stuff all over the globe, but you know, right now we're very focused on, on above. And so we have our, our field campaign in the boreal and Arctic region um, of, of the globe. Um, let's see here. So here's a, a slide showing NASA's Earth observation fleet. So these are all satellite missions that are either currently in operation or will soon be in operation measuring uh, various aspects or various components of the Earth system. And, and one thing to keep in mind, well, there's a couple of things here, I guess two points that I'll make. One is that when we think about observe, observations in the Arctic, um, most of these satellites or a large portion of these satellites are in, in polar orbits or near polar orbits. And what that means is they cross over both poles maybe 16 times a day, 14 to 16 times a day, depending on, on their orbit. So the bottom line is we collect a lot of data over the Arctic that that we use to support our science and many other agencies use to support their science as well as their operational missions. 
And so we, we collect a lot of data that is of, of relevance to the Arctic and, and groups like IARPIC. Uh, the other point I'd like to raise here is that when you propose to NASA, you have all sorts of different calls that you propose to, but it's very important when you read the solicitation and you write your proposal to, to um, consider how it's relevant to NASA. And one of the primary, primary ways to do that is um, to make sure that you're leveraging Earth observation data in some form or another uh, within your proposal. And then we're also, you know, another way to be relevant is um, to make sure that, or not make sure, but you could uh, be relevant by working with Earth system models, because we're also very, very interested and very active in uh, the use and, and maintenance and improvement of Earth system models. So I'm going to turn it over to Torsten and Colleen for a few minutes to talk about the Cryosphere Science Program, and then I'll take it over to talk a little bit about terrestrial ecology and above and a few other things that are, are relevant. Yeah, all right. Um, I can start a little bit, and Colleen, please chime in whenever. So within the Cryosphere Sciences Program, well, as the statement says, we support investigations of polar ice, including the Antarctic and the Greenland ice sheets, polar glaciers, and sea ice on, in both hemispheres that are based on satellite and airborne remote sensing. And that's a big the last, you know, couple of words are kind of important that distinguishes us from uh, NSF in some ways, because, you know, we are a space agency and our science is based on, you know, satellite and airborne remote, remote sensing. This doesn't mean we are not supporting modeling efforts or, or even field campaigns, but the bigger picture, you know, goal is always you know, to utilize um, our, our, you know, satellites that we are sending into space. <clears throat> you know, we are, within the program, we are also supporting bigger satellite missions. One is obviously ISA-2. Another one is uh, Operation Icebridge, which is an airborne mission that, you know, is about to end. And then in the future, the next big thing, I think, on, on, a, on a U.S. site for ICE that's coming up, it's probably nicer to, that is scheduled, scheduled for launch in mid uh, 2022, um, which is uh, uh, a science of barometer, which should be fantastic for uh, ice velocities on the ice sheets, as well as, you know, velocities on the sea ice and I, the sea ice types, etc. And then I have a symbol there on the, on the, on the right uh, of, of Cryosat 2. And that's just to indicate that we have very close collaborations with um, ESA, that we, you know, coordinate solicitations sometimes, we coordinate efforts. Um, so it, it's a very good, um, you know, it's a serious partner agency and, and we try to, um, you know, work together as well as we can. And Mike will talk about this in a little more. Our research solicitations are all all come out through ROSES, um, which is a roughly, uh, well, roughly um, Valentine's Day, February, t February 14th. And, you know, there, I can tell you that, that, there, that there will be a cryo call in the upcoming uh, ROSES 2020. And I think that's all I wanted to say, really, because we want to keep, uh, have lots of time for questions. Uh, Pauline, you want to add anything? Nope. That's good. All right, thanks, Torsten. So I'll briefly introduce the terrestrial ecology program uh, because, as I mentioned, we're very active in the Arctic and boreal region right now through above. Um, and so the, the TE program is really focused on improving our understanding of, of the structure and function of, of terrestrial ecosystems across the globe and how they interact with the atmosphere and hydrosphere. And then we're also very interested in, in uh, major biogeochemical cycles like the carbon and water cycle. Um, and so again, as we've mentioned a couple times already, you know, a lot of our science is facilitated and achieved by using Earth observation data, either by satellites or aircraft. And so that's, that's one thing that we, we look at a lot in, in the TE program. Um, so Torsten already talked about ROSES, um, the solicitation that comes out every year on, on Valentine's Day. And actually, I was a PI before coming to NASA, and I never realized that ROSES was released on Valentine's Day. So until I got to headquarters. I think that's a really nice touch. So uh, thanks, NASA. Anyways, uh, within the TE program, solic solicitation topics vary. So we, we were broadly focused on sort of the keywords and, and the little paragraph described above, but um, within the solicitations that come out, we sort of change our focus from time to time, depending on 
what the community or we see as, as interesting problems to address or tackle. Um, the other thing about the TE program is we have a really long history of supporting what NASA calls large multi-year field campaigns. And so these are big campaigns where, in which we collect airborne observation data, field data, have scientists out in the field, for example, and then also use satellite data to understand some uh, large component of the Earth system or some large biome. So we, we've done things in the past like Boreas, which was all focused on the Canadian boreal forest. We had the LBA field campaign, which was focused on the tropics in Brazil specifically. And now we're doing the Arctic and boreal vulnerability experiment, which was focused in Alaska and Western Canada. And so um, currently TE solicitations that come out are primarily, if not 100% focused on, on supporting above. And so um, that will likely continue at least into the future. And so let me just briefly touch on above. So above is a, it's a 10 year field campaign focused on, on understanding change in the Arctic and boreal region of Canada and Western Alaska uh, using uh, the, a whole suite of measurements from field to airborne to, uh, sorry, field tower to airborne to satellite measurements. Um, as I said, it's a 10 year field campaign. We're about halfway into it and it's, it's been funded across a series of phases. Um, so we've completed phase one, we awarded phase two um, projects probably about a year ago. So they've got another two years left and then we'll move into phase three and then eventually phase four. And the idea of above is to look at the causes of change um, and link that to changes in ecosystems. Um, and then in the later phases, we're gonna look at how those ecosystem changes um, impact or change ecosystem services and how that affects society. Uh, in, in, the, in the Arctic and boreal region as a whole. And so sort of in the beginning of, of above, we collect a lot of airborne data and field data and started looking at causes of change and changes to ecosystems. And now we're transitioning into ecosystem services and social consequences. Um, so I, I think that's all I need to say there. And then there's just two other things I wanna mention is we have, we have um, other programs um, specifically focused, one is focused on students. So we have the, the finest program, Future Investigators, Future Investigators in NASA, NASA Earth and Space Sciences uh, and Technology. And this is an annual solicitation that, that comes out specifically for, for graduate students at universities. Um, these are PI led projects, but the idea is, um, or sorry, these are like academic or, or um, other the student does not lead these projects. The idea is the student writes, writes the grants by themselves. They get feedback from, from their major professor or their advisor um, who serves as the PI as, as um, the PI on the proposal. And then the, the grant goes to the institution. Now, the thing to keep in mind, if you have a student, for example, that's interested in applying to one of these finest awards, um, a, a really good strategy is to actually write a proposal that aligns with the goals in one of um, NASA's different program areas. So for example, if you had a student interested in understanding terrestrial change in the Arctic, you would probably try to align very closely with some of the goals that are lined out in sort of the above experimental plan and the terrestrial ecology program in the large. And the same would be true for cryospheric sciences. If you had a student interested in cryospheric sciences, ideally they would try to tailor their proposal to fit within something that cryospheric sciences is interested in. Uh, we also have an early career program called the New Investigator Program. I was actually a NASA NIP awardee when I was when I started my academic career, um, and the same same applies to this. Um, when you write these NIP proposals as a as a new a new professor, for example, or a new scientist somewhere, it's a good idea to align to a NASA program. Um, what else did I want to say about this? Oh, one one strange thing about the NIP is that it can only have one PI and that is, that is the new investigator. Um, so you can't have any co-PIs or co-Is as NASA calls them on the, on the project. You can have collaborators, um, but the money goes solely to the principal investigator, the, the early career person, and none of the co-Is or uh, co-PIs can have money going to them. So that's a little bit unique to that uh, program. And so I, I just wanna close um, before we start the discussion, showing this slide again with a link to uh, the NASA ESD website um, and on that website, you can look at all our different focus areas and then click through them to see all the different programs within those focus areas. Um, so there's a lot of different programs and, um, and many of them can have or do have research going on in the Arctic. Uh, but it's right now, we're, I think it was just more efficient to, to 
organize according to focus area uh, for this presentation rather than talking about each individual program because there are a lot. So I encourage you to go look at those. And then with that, I guess we'll, we will open it up for, for discussion and questions. And feel free to add anything I missed, Torsten or Colleen. Um, <clears throat> just a reminder, everybody, you can ask questions in the chat box like I demonstrated before, or you're welcome to come off of mute and just ask your question. The mute button is in the bottom left. And even if you think you didn't mute yourself, I probably muted you, so you should go check and see. <laughs> and yeah, please fire away. There was one question in the chat, um, Mike. Susan asks if the student programs are open to students from other countries. Um, I do not believe so, but Colleen or Torsten might have a different idea. I believe NASA in general only funds uh, institutions or PIs that are based in the US. It's really hard to get money to, to foreign foreign agencies or foreign governments. Uh, yeah, I mean, we, we only can send money to, uh, you know, uh, academia within the United States, but the person doesn't need to be from the country. It can be, of course, the student who has a different nationality. That does not matter, but that's a question. This is Peter Griffith, I'll add, um, regarding the NASA internships, um, that does have a citizenship requirement, um, unfortunately. Uh, however, uh, NASA has formal relationships with quite a number of other countries um, to provide internships with funding from, for instance, the Canadian Space Agency, if it's a, um, a Canadian citizen. So that's worth looking into if you're, um, you know, not th these aren't the opportunities that are in roses, but they are in the uh, the NASA internship program. This is a uh, Bryce Luce from the University of Rhode Island. I have uh, two follow-up questions about the finest program. The first is, uh, are, are there? I was looking and I was trying to determine if there are specific eligibility requirements related to the stage in a person's graduate career. Like, is it really intended for? Um, senior undergraduates and uh, first or second year graduates, kind of like the NSF GRFP. Uh, and the second question is, do you, um, is it important that the, um, that the subject of the finest um, project be speaking directly to, a, to an active ROSES call, um, like for that solicitation round for that year, or is it, is it should it just speak to the project goals of the, of the different uh, research directorates. I can answer the second part of that question, and then maybe Peter has a lot of experience with finest. He might be able to remember the details on the first part of your question, or Colleen as well, um, or Torsten. So, with regard to the second part of your question, uh, it, I don't. It does not matter if you align with a, a current solicitation in Roses. Um, I, I think more importantly, the science question has to align uh, with one of the interests within one of the program areas within NASA and the goals of NASA or science in general. Okay, thanks. And my, my recollection, I, you know, I was uh, involved with Finest as a reviewer in the past. I haven't been involved much since I've been at headquarters, but my recollection is, and Peter can correct me if I'm wrong or somebody can correct me if I'm wrong, uh, that it does not matter the stage of career uh, like it would for or sorry, the stage of the graduate degree program or the level of the student um, as it would for something like NSF or for like USDA and NIFA. Uh, yeah, that is, that's correct. I've seen um, a range of uh, successful um, proposals and it doesn't, uh, it doesn't seem to matter if they're just starting out or if they're, you know, midway through. Um, and uh, regarding the, um, uh, applicability to a specific uh, ongoing program. Um, uh, generally, what uh, it's absolutely true what uh, Mike just said, uh, that the uh, proposals 
um, are rigorously reviewed to see that they are responsive uh, to each element of the solicitation and, and the responsiveness to uh, NASA Earth Science um, goals and focus area elements that are in the, uh, so in the solicitation, uh, you know, make sure the student responds explicitly to those to make it really easy for the um, reviewers. Uh, that being said, um, if, if a, a student is um, doing something that is uh, applicable to a ongoing activity like, uh, like NASA above or the carbon monitoring system or something in ocean biology, bio geochemistry or cryosphere, uh, a program manager uh, can um, decide to put extra funding in. So if the ranking of the student's proposal is in the selectable, you know, is highly competitive, uh, but isn't um, picked up uh, overall by the panel, it can be picked up by a program manager um, who augments the, um, the funding to the solicitation beyond what is actually in the call itself. Okay, great. Yeah, thanks for that information. Um, I have a quick question. My name is Billy Armstrong. I'm a professor at Appalachian State University in Western North Carolina. Um, we're a primarily undergraduate institution. I was just wondering if, uh, if NASA <clears throat> in the cryospheric section has any uh, programs that are specifically targeted towards primarily undergraduate institutions or uh, sort of how, how those are considered in applications. I mean, for science, you as a professor can, of course, write um, a proposal to any of the Roses calls and in your proposal support undergraduate students if you want to. So that's a perfectly fine solution. And from panels that I've been on, this is uh, seen highly valuable if, um, you know, young students are being trained as part of, you know, active research efforts. Okay, so it's it's like, uh, I know with, with NSF, they, you have to put like uh, PUI, you know, there's a, a separate category and it supposedly is kind of like an X factor kind of thing. There's not a, a separate funding pool, but it's, you get like, it, it can be something that bumps you uh, if it's a, a close decision on funding, it, it's, Sounds like it, there's not an analogous program in, in NASA. Is that uh, not that I'm aware of? But you know, the other people have been much longer at headquarters than I have. I mean, my yeah, no, I don't. Not that I'm aware of. Um, yep. For undergrads, I would uh, suggest again the internship program that I okay. mentioned. It's not. It doesn't. Uh, you know, provide a year's worth of support or something, but it does provide. Um, um, you know, uh, eight or nine weeks, I forget what it is, uh, of uh, paid um, internship uh, at a NASA center. And those are, those are great opportunities for undergrads. Yeah, thanks. I'll definitely recommend those. One other thing um, that I'll mention, I guess, related to that is there, there is um, the Space Grant Consortium of Universities that oftentimes have uh, uh, funding available to undergraduates. Now, I think that primarily applies to land-grant institutions, and it's uh, separate from NASA, but um, that is something else that can be considered as well. I know I took advantage of those funds when I was an academic um, in Michigan. Yeah, that's a great thing to know about. Thanks for putting it on my radar. That's kind of what you're saying, right, because you're a member of lawyers really tend toward as low as possible. Right? Yeah. That's probably not what happened right there. Somebody's not on mute. I don't remember. It's probably well thank you for that information on those things. You're welcome. There's a few more questions in the chat. I don't know if you guys have taken a look at it and wanna pick one.
I'm having a hard time finding the chat window, Jessica. Oh, because you're sharing your screen. Um, so the one I see first, sorry if this is out of order, Cheryl's asking, do you support student research focused in the Antarctic cryospheric sciences? Uh, I don't see why not. Of course, I love the Antarctic. Um, it's actually my favorite hemisphere um, or my favorite polar region. No, but in all seriousness, absolutely. There's no difference between Arctic or Antarctic. Yeah, the IARPIC is focused primarily on Arctic research. Um, but yeah, the NASA cryosphere program covers all of the cryosphere. Almost definitely, yeah. Um, Alan's asking, does NASA fund the how we do research, how we do our research in addition to the research itself? Um, I think that is referring to cyber infrastructure. So in the Rosen's call, there are specific calls for, you know, things like that. And one is called access, and I don't know what it stands for right now. Uh, a C C E S S um, that where people can uh, pro uh, propose uh, things like um, data management, cyber infrastructure, etc. But yeah, there's also uh, the the high performance computing uh, program element that would solicit for that. That there as well, correct. Um, and a new question that I missed from earlier, apologies to Sasha, um, he's asking a question about um, incorporating indigenous communities into long-term ecological monitoring, saying that it requires long-term consistent funding. Um, and the question is, does NASA have a strategy for addressing these problems? problems through funding calls that are longer than three years. Either you want to comment on that, Torsten or Colleen, or I can take a crack at it. Yeah, go for it. I mean, I think this is something that we are currently um, struggling with a little bit. One of the solutions that the TE program has taken to do that is to do these big multi-year field campaigns like we're doing with above. Again, that, that's longer than three years. It's, you know, outlined to be a 10 year project and what happens beyond that to all the infrastructure and the, and the monitoring capabilities is to be determined. So um, that's one way we've looked to get around it, but I think it is something that, that we do st still struggle with. I could add with above um, that we've had um, extensive consultations um, with uh, Indigenous um, groups, First Nations, um, Indigenous corporations in um, in Alaska. It's not the same thing that you're talking about in terms of funding for students, but we we've, we've uh, you know tried to maintain uh, uh, respectful listening and conversation with um, uh, with Indigenous groups through uh, through the course of uh, above. One of the ways that we've uh, helped with um, some of the indigenous students is um, providing uh, invitational travel, um, getting uh, students to science team uh, meetings or um, providing opportunities to go into the field. Um, in the phase one of above, uh, the, the, some of the projects were allowed to have four years of funding. Um, and uh, when the PIs are successful in the, throughout the different phases, uh, as Mike was uh, talking about, then you can end up um, you know, with, a, with a six or a 10 year uh, experience. Um, but, uh, and you know, maybe Mike or, or Torsten wants to say something about this, but N NASA doesn't really do long-term ecological monitoring on the ground. Uh, NASA's long-term Earth observation program of record is in space. Um, and we tend to have field campaigns, uh, you know, to Antarctica or Greenland or 
the middle of the Atlantic Ocean or to Brazil or to North America. Um, but th those, th those might, in some cases, create an infrastructure. For instance, in Brazil, uh, we built a whole bunch of research bases that we turned over to the National Institute for Amazonian Research at the end of the project. And many of those are still running. But, but NASA is not in the, in the business of, of long-term ecological monitoring on, at ground sites. That's, that's very true. I mean, there are some, some situations in which we find, we'll find a data set or a, a long-term uh, record that is really useful, for example, to the terrestrial ecology program. And so sometimes we'll fund um, the continuation of observations. And the one that comes to mind is the atmospheric CO2 measurements that are that we fund through uh, Scripps Institute of o Oceanography. That's something that um, we, we do to continue to support because that's a very valuable data set to uh, the Trustworthy Ecology Program and other scientific programs at NASA. Um, but in general, Peter's correct. Um, the long-term record that we support is space-based observations. Um, <clears throat> the, not to detract from the NASA focus of this, program manager chat, but I do want to point out in light of that question that we have another program manager chat with NSF coming up on March 20th, and they'll be talking about some more programs that could be long term. For example, the Arctic Observing Network and the Research Coordination Networks. I just shared a link to that in the chat. If any of you would like to join, please do. I was looking back at the chat and there was a question from Kirk that says, can NIP proposals overlap in scope with other NASA solicitations or do they need to have to be something that doesn't fall under the scope of others? Um, so for NIP, the new investigators, that can, um, you can definitely submit to that with something that would align directly with another um, ROSE's call. So. Uh, the point here is to uh, get submissions from those early career people and, uh, you know, evaluate that pool. So um, I would say that we definitely see things submitted to NIP that could easily be submitted to the cryospheric sciences call, for example. I could address, there's another um, chat um, uh, from Igor um, about um, seasonal snow cover. Uh, so that, oddly enough, is not covered in the cryospheric science. That's in um, terrestrial hydrology program. Um, and there is a um, uh, field campaign that's in formulation uh, phase for, north, uh, for high latitudes North America. Uh, um, it's part of the SNOWX S-N-O-W-E-X, um, and um, uh, they are hoping to have a, um, a snow albedo and snow water uh, equivalent and snow uh, you know, phenology um, uh, field campaign, maybe in the 2021 or 2022 timeframe. Jared Enton is the program manager uh, who is um, leading that. I don't know if any of the headquarters people want to add something to that, my comments. No, I don't, that's great. I don't have anything to add. There's a question from Cheryl about um, finest and the finest and other fellowships require a NASA technical advisor. If a student submits a proposal to a ROSA solicitation, is a technical advisor required? And um, I'm not quite clear if you're asking if if a student submits to a, a ROSA solicitation other than finest or a fellowship program, would a technical advisor be required? Um, I don't think so, although I think it would be kind of um, uncommon for a student to be a PI on a, on a non-fellowship solicitation. I could be misinterpreting the question. 
And the, the finest uh, proposals do require a university, um, uh, they don't require a NASA technical advisor, but they require a university PI, or if it's, uh, it's typically a university PI, it could be an NGO um, that is the PI and the um, student is, uh, um, what's the jargon they're using now? Um, it's not, not, not an early career. Um, I'm, I'm forgetting the jar, jargon term, but yes, the student must have a, uh, a um, uh, major professor as a you know, PI. So thanks for all the questions, everybody. It's been a good discussion. We still have plenty of time for more. And I just want to encourage you, if you want to just come off of mute and turn on your webcam and keep the discussion flowing, we welcome you to do that. This is Bryce Luce again um, from the University of Rhode Island. I have a question about um, a rumor I heard that possibly, uh, and, and this might not be specifically cryospheric sciences, but there might be an upcoming call uh, from um, the Earth Observing Program on plastics. And I wondered if you'd, if that's a, if there's truth to that, and if you know anything, if you could share anything with us about that. Um, I haven't heard anything about that. Um, and just as a rule of thumb, unless it's already announced in Roses, we're not allowed to talk about future solicitations. Um, so even if I had heard about it, I wouldn't be permitted to say anything unless it was already announced. I see. Okay. To Mary Jo's question about the links, yes, um, I will compile all of the links to these programs that have been mentioned and include them on the event page for this webinar, um, unless one of the presenters has it on hand right now and could share it in the chat. I was I was looking for it. The uh, I think. It looks like she's asking for who was awarded. Yeah, exactly. So I was going to try to find that link. So I'm looking. Okay. Well, I don't see any new questions popping up. Is anybody? Sorry, this is Alan Pope. Um, I had a quick question since, so I work for IASC, the International Arctic Science Committee. And one of the things we really try and support is getting scientists from different disciplines to work with each other. And I know you were describing some of the individual ROSES calls, but how much, I guess, how much happens behind the scenes at, NS, at NASA sorry, to, to help interdisciplinary sorts of projects find their niche? Or are there ways to help these ideas which might not fit within set structures or set programs kind of gain traction or find if they fit with the overall goals of what NASA are trying to do, but maybe not only one of the programs? Is there scope for trying to support those sorts of, yeah, interdisciplinary projects? Um, hi, Alan. So every couple of years, NASA has an IDS call out. IDS stands for Interdisciplinary Sciences. And exactly the scope is exactly what you're describing, where, you know, 
that call is for proposals that are bigger than just one discipline, where inter this interdisciplinarity is actually, actually required. So that's where atmospheric sciences, cryoscience, and you know, ocean science come together and formulate uh, you know, um, what, you know, um, formulate um, a proposal that uh, expresses what should be done. A proposal call. Yeah, okay, so it's something that happens episodically as opposed to something that is, say, built in on a, what if, you're, what if you have an idea but it doesn't happen to be in one of those years where there's an IDS call? I mean, sure. I would recommend, oh, go ahead, Torsten. No, oh, no, go ahead. I was just gonna say, I would recommend um, finding the program that most closely aligns with what, or maybe the two programs that most closely align and um, talking to the program managers. Uh, you know, we will see things in cryospheric sciences um, that does overlap, you know, is somewhat interdisciplinary if it's looking at um, interactions between like sea ice and atmosphere and ocean, um, or even, you know, like glaciers and polar bears or penguins, you know, we do get those proposals in. And um, in those cases, when we review those proposals, we bring in other program managers and, you know, try to get the right people reviewing those proposals. And um, oftentimes, if two programs are interested in a proposal like that, you know, we have ways of co-funding projects. Um, so I would, but, you know, maybe talk to someone beforehand and uh, see if you can get, um, you know, some recommendations of where the best place to submit is. Because yeah, every three years um, is kind of a long time to wait for those interdisciplinary things. So, um, you know, we do try to find a home for things if we can. Great, thanks so much. And one other question, since I haven't heard anyone else speaking up, um, how much scope is there for collaborating with international partners within NASA? And are there any co-funding mechanisms with other funding agencies in other countries or anything like that? I mean, Silence not, doesn't seem to bode well. <laughs> uh, it's a tricky one because you cannot send money, you know, abroad very easily. Um, yeah, yeah, I guess I I'm thinking of things like, you know, NSF and NERC have an agreement that's helped fund, you know, UK scientists in the UK, US scientists in the US, um, but that work on those questions together. So it keeps the funding in the, the individual countries, but the, the, the bigger science gets to happen. But looks like we, someone we, has a, a suggestion in the chat box too. We, we have certain things like that that come along once, once in a while. And one is this global methane challenge that was just announced at AGU, which is um, a collaboration between NASA and the European Space Agency. And it's very much a structure like you described where We'll have European scientists funded by by ESA, and then some NASA scientists or, or U.S. scientists funded by NASA, looking at methane globally. Um, but again, I think these are—it's not a specific program. These are sort of grass grassroots, or maybe maybe it's not grassroots, top-down sort of approaches where you know some some people from NASA and ESA are talking somewhere, and they'll come up with this idea, and um, then it'll go forth from there. Great. Thanks. There's, there's other things I can think of, like with above, we have a memorandum of understanding with Polar Knowledge Canada. Um, that's a formal uh, relationship where uh, Polar Knowledge Canada has solicited Canadian research that's relevant to above. Uh, and so they'll be, um, they'll be funding um, Canadian scientists at Canadian uh, institutions through that solicitation. Um, and I can think of other cases where NASA funded, um, you know, I, I'm, Torsten, I'm very uh, terrestrial uh, uh, ecology related, but I think you probably have examples in the, in the cryosphere, the 
um, with some of the future satellite missions, um, like NISAR, for instance. Um, there's a, a lot of NASA funded people that are working on some of the ground validation uh, efforts with German Space Agency and Indian Space Agency funded foreign scientists um, uh, with airborne simulators and with ground uh, uh, measurements, um, uh, you know, in design um, phases. Um, so those, you know, those are highly inter international uh, in cases like that. And Thorsten, you may have examples that, oh, that you think of from cryosphere. Great, thanks. There's a couple more questions yeah. in the chat. I don't know if you guys have seen those. Um, yeah, with regards to the NIP solicitation being specific to, to ESD, no, it, it goes across all uh, our, of our four different science divisions, um, which would include what heliophysics, astrophysics, and planetary science, along with Earth, Earth science. Actually, I was commenting about finest, which does certainly span. I'm not 100% certain on, on the new investigator program. My assumption is yes. Yeah, we can. Um, so the program manager for finest and NIP is Allison Leidner, and we can um, share her information. Um, and she could answer some of these questions, certainly. I'm also not sure about if they can submit to proposals or not, if they're working on something that's planetary and something that's earth focused. I'm not sure. That sounds like a cool project, an interplanetary PhD program. <laughs> uh, I can answer the question about the global, uh, it's actually the Arctic methane um, uh, yeah, sorry, I, I realized yeah. I just said the title. Uh, and uh, we, we are actually uh, building a website for that <laughs> uh, currently, so uh, you're, you're not going to find it yet because it, uh, it doesn't exist yet. Um, the NASA point of contact for the Arctic Methane Challenge is um, Chip Miller from uh, Jet Propulsion Lab. Uh, and I don't know how much uh, I'll put his... Uh, there's his contact. Um, I, you, you might wait a few um, weeks before you contact um, Chip because I'm, I'm not sure that he has much of anything that he can say about it at the, uh, at the moment. Watch the space as they, as they say. Hey, Mike, or this is Sarah. Um, Peter, if, if, when there is a bit more information to share on that, can you post that on the website? I think there'll be a lot of interest in that. Yeah, that's a, uh, in fact, um, um, Mike, maybe you, you could, once we know more on it, and, and I'm sure Chip will tell us when he's got more to, of substance to say, it's probably a good idea for him to do, uh, a, you know, one of these um, webinar sessions on it. Yeah, he could either he could either do a collaboration team presentation for the permafrost collaboration team potentially, or even give a presentation at staff groups. I'll follow up with you, Mike. Thanks. There's a few more minutes left. If anybody's been hesitating to ask a question, 
encourage you to go ahead. Uh, Sasha is asking in the chat if your proposal calls or other products are provided in multiple languages. I don't believe I don't so. Believe... Go ahead. Go ahead, Colleen. I said I don't believe so, but I yeah, I was going to say I don't believe so for the proposal calls, but I do know that NASA is starting to do a lot more of its outreach products in Spanish. Um, the new NASA calendar they made in a Spanish version and um, a lot of those types of materials, they are doing that. Um, yep. But I don't, I don't think the proposal calls are. Yeah, I've never seen the solicitation itself be in anything uh, than bureaucratic English, uh, <laughs> which is a dialect of, of normal English. Um, but uh, in terms of NASA product dis dissemination for Earth science, there's the SERVIR program, S-E-R-V-I-R, that, uh, that you can look up. And it does make a real point of, of having actionable um, NASA data products in um, quite a number of languages in um, various parts of the world. And a question from Michael McFerrin. Does NASA offer any sort of organized short turnaround funding similar to NSF's rapid grants for time sensitive environmental studies, for instance, major ENSO events or large ice sheet melt season events? Either you want to take that, Torsen or Colleen? No? OK. I believe we do have a, a rapid response program. I'm not super familiar with it. So if you were to look through the ROSES solicitation, you may indeed find or find something. Yeah, uh, there, there is. And it, that's exactly what it's called, the um, uh, rapid response and uh, um, when it's an open solicitation that's that uh, is without um, you know without an active date and without a due date um, throughout the Rosa cycle uh, and you would direct uh, the request um, to a particular program element so it might be a rapid response proposal that goes to Torsten because it's an ice sheet collapse or something or a rapid response that goes to uh, Mike because it's uh, wildfire uh, in, you know, the boreal forest or something like that. And, and in fact, above uh, awarded a rapid response uh, because of the 2014 wildfires in Northwest Territories when uh, so nearly 3 million hectares were burned in one, in one year. My, my understanding is that before you submit one of those, you should have a conversation with a program manager to make sure um, that they are initially supportive of the idea rather than than taking the time to write the proposal and then having it fall on onto a program manager's desk who either doesn't have funding to support it or or isn't interested in the idea. So just just a word of caution. Well, yeah, thanks for sharing that. I did not know about that. Another reason we're having that NSF program manager chat next month is to highlight their rapid proposals because we think the community doesn't know that that type of opportunity exists. So I will make sure I coordinate with you guys after the webinar to share that on our website. I think a lot of people would be interested in learning more about those.
I'm going to have to bail. I've got an hour and a half telecon <laughs> to get on. Okay, I think it's about time. So if thank you everybody so much for participating. Um, if you have any follow up questions, you can get in touch with me or post on the website. I'll put my email in the chat here. A recording will be available next week. And thank you. And thank especially you. thanks Mike and Torsen and Colleen for all of your input on this. Yeah, thanks. Thanks everyone for calling in and the great questions. And thanks to Peter too. I didn't know he was gonna be on. He was very helpful. So that's yeah, great. Yeah, thanks Peter. <laughs> Okay, bye everybody. Bye. Bye. Bye.